students, you must be very hard pressed with plethora of lectures and classes, online classes, coming continuously from various teachers. But we do not have any option, especially for me, I can tell you that I do not have any option. I have been asked to address or rather to take up nine assignments with you. All these are prose assignments and therefore, I have to take up texts after texts in quick succession so that I can finish my syllabus and do whatever I can do for you. Today, I shall take up with you John Dryden's very famous an essay on dramatic poesy. I think I do I think you do have many of you have with you this textbook English critical texts where you can easily get a number of prose essays by various masterminds and all these essays are included in your syllabus. So, an essay of dramatic poesy that is the essay by Dryden that we propose to take up today. Once again, I repeat an essay of dramatic poesy. Now, before I go into the details, may I tell you something very quickly about the neoclassical age to which Dryden belonged. Dryden, as you know, was famous, was famously known as the neoclassicist. And a few words about the rise of neoclassicism in England. Well, neoclassical age or the literature or the texts or the writings which came in the neoclassical age were more or less imitations of the ancient writers, poets, etc. Especially the neoclassical poetry imitated largely poets like Virgil. The neoclassical age had on it the French influence and also the Italian influence. And realism was a part of neoclassicism, realism and formalism, these are the two tenets of the neoclassical age. And here we can describe this age, we have also, we have told this to you earlier also. So, we can describe this age as the age of prose and reason. So, this age saw a marked decline in the creation 
or production of lyrical poetry. And the age was famous for the production, the creation and the composition of great satires. One of the hallmarks of this neoclassical age in England was the heroic couplet. The heroic couplet was something which was taken up by the poets. Didacticism and decorum were also formidable parts or very important parts or very important characters of the neoclassical age. Dryden, John Dryden, 1631 to 1700 is a great personality of this neoclassical age. He was a poet, a playwright and a critic all rolled in one. Now, now let us uh, go proceed to the text of the essay and an essay of dramatic poesy. And very briefly, I will tell you the historical background of this, of this particular essay. What is the historical background? I shall tell you uh, right now. In 1663, a Frenchman visited England. And this Frenchman was Sorbier, Samuel Sorbier, Samuel S A M U E L, Sorbier S O R B I E R E, Samuel Sorbier, the Frenchman, visited England in 1663. And, well, he was a a diplomat perhaps and he came here on some diplomatic mission and returning home he unfavorably wrote in fact rather disparagingly wrote about English science and English stage. John Dryden wanted to present this an essay of dramatic poesy as a rejoinder to the disparaging remarks of this Frenchman Samuel Sobier. In 1665, there was a terrible plague in London the London plague and many people retired from the city of London to the countryside and well Dryden also for the time being moved away from London and he was enjoying a new condition, a new environment and he wrote out this particular piece. Now, I do not know whether you have already read your Plato. If you have read your Plato, you know that Plato used to present his ideas in a dialogue from form. So, Plato's dialogues we say. So, the very critical ideas would be presented to the readers through the mouth of characters. Here also in his an essay of dramatic poesy, Dryden uses four characters. And through these four characters, he presents 
his arguments. And as I said, these arguments were primarily a rejoinder to the comments by the Frenchman who disparagingly wrote about the English stage. Now, the, the piece which Dryden wrote was published, first published in 1668. And here we find the acumen of Dryden as a critique. If we do have time, uh, we shall be definitely taking up this Dryden as a critique. And how a critique should maintain an objective point of view that was clearly shown by Dryden in this piece. So, in this an essay on dramatic poesy, there are a number of issues which are taken up and we shall be discussing them one by one. And I tell you that the, this, this discussion cannot be complete in one lecture. We shall be giving you small lectures, meaning lectures of smaller duration, say 30 minutes a lecture and I shall take up maybe three lectures to at least address some issues that are there in this text. I told you right now that Dryden introduces characters, four characters. These are Eugenius, Critus, Lycidas and Neander. These four characters, their four friends, they discuss several issues and the, these discussions come in the form of their dialogues. These four people actually are real people given imaginary names. Now, Cretus was Dryden's brother-in-law and his real name was Robert Howard. Eugenius was Dryden's friend and he was Charles Sackville. Lycidius was a young wit of the day, a contemporary young wit and his real name was Charles Sedley and Neander was Dryden himself. So these four characters, fictitious names but real characters meaning existing in real life. Through them Dryden addresses several issues. Today I shall be taking up the first issue or rather one of the most important issues that Dryden addresses here in this essay. A controversy about the comparative merits of the ancients and the moderns. Now this debate of the ancients with the moderns is a perpetual debate and I shall refer to at least one play in the ancient times which took up this issue. You may have heard the name of 
Aristophanes. Aristophanes is a frogs, very famous one. And there, the same issue is taken up. The debate between the ancients and the moderns. Are the ancients superior to the moderns? Or are the mad moderns superior to the ancients? So this debate is also taken up in Dryden's essay through two characters. How I shall be talking right now. Now, I have just mentioned to you the name of the ancient play by Aristophanes, Frogs. But a later man, an intellectual, well, also took up the same issue in one of his most interesting essays. And that is Swift's Battle of Books. If you care to read Battle of Books, you should see the same debate over there. Here two characters are employed for this particular debate. Cretus speaking in favor of the ancients and Eugenius speaking in favor of the moderns. And Dryden or Neander throughout shows a kind of objectivity. Now, what Dryden wanted to show through this debate is that the moderns have to be in have to remain indebted to the ancients because the heritage of the ancients cannot be denied. Well, the contribution of the ancients must be accepted. But on the other hand, the achievements of the moderns must be recognized. Now, the debate starts with Eugenius giving the definition of drama. And there Eugenius says that the drama is the lively and just image of human nature. So what is drama? It is the lively and just image of human nature, representing its passions and humors and the changes of fortune to which it is subject for the delight and instruction of mankind. So please note the main the major points. So what is drama? It is lively, it is a lively image of human nature and it represents the passions and humors of the humans and it also shows the changes of fortune in man's life. But what is the purpose? The purpose is to give us delight as well as instruction. Now, Critus uh, well, will be, as I said, that well, you know, the Critus and Eugenius are the two speakers, and Critics well advocates for the ancients, and he begins with Sydney. And uh, 
well he talks of the 16th and the 17th century scholars and uh, he also mentions that playwrights of the day they had been using loose and loose plots and uh, the popular drama therefore could not stand beside the earlier drama and therefore the earlier drama the ancient dramas were superior to the dramas or the plays of the modern playwrights now remember one thing that the debate was to be based only on the issue of drama so the reference point is drama alone not anything else therefore critus begins with his defense or rather his arguments in favor of the ancients who could write good plots compact plots which the moderns could not they create or rather construct loose plots therefore in plot making the ancients are definitely superior now critus points out or rather refers to aristotle and aristotle's dictums aristotle talked of the three unities the unities according to critus are realistic and the ancients followed the three unities and the moderns on the other hand very often flouted the three unities of aristotle the moderns very often flout either all the three unities or one or two unities which according to critus was making their plays inferior the greatness of the greek drama depended on the adherence to these three unities the poetry dramatic poetry is something which reflects human nature and to do that the adherence to the unities was a necessity moreover in ancient trot in ancient times especially in greece and also in rome poetry was most honored of all such honor was not given to poets and their creations in the modern times rewards and recognition used to be given to the poets who participated in competitions in ancient greece and all the playwrights tried to emulate the greatest wit of the day and 
there were instances of envy and admiration this instances of envy and admiration in fact improved their art but in modern times there was no such competition only competition can improve the merit of a practicing poet if there is no competition then there was no scope for the improvement of the merit of the poet now the ancients could organize their plays better because they had the their discipline and this discipline was derived from their ways of life and one who could organize one's play well would naturally be considered a better writer now well uh, critics arguments are countered by eugenius eugenius says the moderns have progressed hugely and they have a privilege because the ancients did not have any models before them the moderns have their models they can read the plays of the ancient playwrights and poets and use them and can write their plays in a better way then eugenius says that well well you know critus was talking of the principles of aristotle but all the rules of aristotle were not observed by all the ancients and here i pause to tell you that this is correct we cannot say that all the greek playwrights followed all the principles of yes as i was telling you that uh, we cannot say that all the greek playwrights followed all the dictums of aristotle properly correctly or sincerely we can give examples of a number of greek plays where some unities were not strictly observed so the issue of aristotelian unities cannot be raised to prove the superiority of the ancients and the inferiority of the moderns the next point that eugenius raises is this that the unities of aristotle should be very closely examined and if they are closely examined we may feel that the unity of place depends on the unity of time and unity of action is something which has to be observed by all playwrights whether they are ancients or they are moderns therefore it was meaningless to demean the modern playwrights on aristotelian grounds then he says 
that in ancient times there was no novelty of plot. What does he mean by novelty of plot? Now it was mandatory on the part of the playwrights that they had to take up the story or, or the fable either from mythology or from an existing epic. In other words, the story of the play should be something known, already known to the audience. There is no novelty. The playwrights had to depend on existing plots. They could not, they were not allowed to invent new plots. Therefore, well, the question of, if we take up the question of novelty, the modern playwrights are greater than the ancients. Another point that he makes is that, well, in ancient plays, we do not find any poetic justice. Do you know what is poetic justice? That the good will be rewarded and the bad will be punished. Never happens. It never happens in, in ancient plays. At least with our sensibility, if you, when we judge the play, we find the downfall of Oedipus or Antigone meaningless. They were not responsible for their downfall. So no poetic justice. Bad men are never punished and good men are hardly rewarded. So in, in ancient plays, there is no poetic justice, which is very dissatisfying to the common people who watch the play. This is a point raised by Eugenius. Eugenius also says that, well, in ancient times, tragedies and comedies were written by separate sets of playwrights. Normally, a playwright writing a tragedy would not try his hand in comedy and the vice versa. But in modern times, this does not happen. In fact, the same writer can write both the tragedy and a comedy. And the point that Eugenius tries to raise is that Life is a continuous flow. It consists both of tragedy and comedy. And therefore, well, tragic passions and comic elements, they cannot be separated like that. So, a man writing a tragedy must have familiarity with the comic elements of life too. But in ancient times, this was not there. And then, well, uh, love, the emotion of love. Uh, well, in ancient plays, we do not find the depiction of the emotion of love. Love is one of the noblest sentiments of human life, but love is not there. And in, in ancient plays, the feelings of the soul are not expressed properly, expressed right in ancient plays. And finally, uh, he says that 
that the ancient playwrights perhaps were a little behind in the question of expression of emotions emotions of human life what we find in eugenius is that eugenius is definitely very very emphatic in his in his criticism of the ancient playwrights but well he is not that emphatic in showing the particular merits of the modern playwrights now he says that these and these and these were the defects of the ancient playwrights but he does not show us emphatically clearly logically the special areas where moderns can be said to score above the ancients now this is the well set of arguments given by critus and eugenius and now we conclude now dryden or neander who is a kind of a controller a compere a coordinator he never says anything he doesn't make any statement regarding this issue but when we conclude when we come to the conclusion of this argument in our conclusion in our own remarks in our own reflections we can say that such a controversy is simply meaningless simply meaningless the controversy whether the ancients are better or whether the moderns are better well this is an old one and this controversy could never be resolved now there are problems there are defects and there are merits both in the ancient plays and in the modern plays but to 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 disparage one to eulogize the other will be a wrong method for any critic well the argument will never end and the argument will go on unendingly there are we can raise some points about culture the culture of an age changes and a new culture new thoughts new ethos new ideas they come up and the writers whether they are playwrights or poets they have to follow the new ethos the new culture of the new age and this is normal i can remind you of t.s eliot's great essay which you have read or will be reading uh, tradition and individual talent so tradition cannot be denied and individual talent is also the greatest thing that holds the flow of human journey alive t s eliot pointed out 
that the moderns of today, the contemporary poets of today, will become poets of the past in the future generation. So, they will also be a part of the ancient tradition. So, it is meaningless to go on arguing like this. Thank you, but this is just one topic that I have taken up today. I shall, well, there are so many, but then it is not possible to, to touch upon so many things. Well, we have uh, very little time at our disposal, and I do not know, well, uh, well, whether you can hold your patience for longer times on only one text. I shall take up two more topics with you on this text. Presently, I shall be delivering my lectures on those two topics, on the same text. Thank you for the day. Thank you.